<laughs> Hi everyone, good morning. Uh, this is uh, finally, a, 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 I think, a really nice and sunny morning, which I think is helpful in many ways. So um, really thank you for joining us for this very, very special joint MIA and CCNE seminar. We're really excited about it. Um, and uh, Alex is actually going to uh, introduce Michael Bronstein and also tell you a little bit how to be interactive uh, in the session and how to ask questions. So we have it sort of CCNE and MIA style where you can interact with the speaker. Um, so just a few housekeeping notes before we start. So next week, April 13th, uh, CCNE will be hosting Fei Chen, uh, who will talk about his very interesting uh, new technologies that he's using. Uh, the next Monday, uh, April 20th, will be off uh, for uh, Pat's Day. Uh, and today we have Michael Bronstein, as I said, he's joining us from London. And Alex Blumenthal is going to introduce him and moderate this uh, session. Alex, to you. Um, Ari, thank you so much. And uh, everyone, thanks so much for joining. What a, what a, what a pleasure to host uh, a, a session like this. Um, we're so excited to have Michael here, but I'm also so excited to see all, all these people logging in. I see 167, 168, um, people are still joining us. Uh, good morning. Um, so yeah, so Michael uh, is joining us from London. Um, welcome, Michael. He's a professor at Imperial College there and head of graph learning research at Twitter. Um, he's former founder and chief scientist at Fabula AI, uh, which was acquired by Twitter in 2019 and formal, or former principal engineer at Intel. Um, Michael received his PhD from Technion um, in Israel, in, in uh, Institute of Technology in Israel. Um, and he's going to be telling us about geometric deep learning for functional protein design. Um, now, this is uh, what, a, what a great um, talk to be hosting jointly. Um, excited to, to, for MIA to be doing this together with cell circuits and epigenomics. We've done this once or twice before. Um, and it's also wonderful to have an event because uh, sort of in our case, we decided for MIA to sort of postpone, um, given the current situation in most cases, uh, well, well, we might revisit that, but uh, at the moment um, we're kind of on hold. So, so how, how wonderful to have uh, to have something during this time. Um, and uh, a note about questions: we'd like to try to make this as interactive as possible. So, um, so please feel free to interrupt with your questions at any time. You have two ways to do that. All right, everyone, pay attention for one minute. Two ways to ask questions: you can do it this way. You can. Uh, type a question in the Q&A, or you can raise your hand if you want to actually ask your question verbally. Um, and if you want to do that, please make sure that your microphone is working and that you're unmuted when, I'm, when I unmute you. So this is a webinar, so you have to raise your hand at which point uh, Scott will unmute you, and then, and then you can ask your question. But if, so if you do that, please make sure your microphone is working. Thank, thank you very much, everyone. Um, and I'll hand it over to Michael. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I should say that that's the first time I'm doing a talk over Zoom. I hope that it works well. And especially I hope that I'm not disturbed by my five years old uh, son, that I told him that if he walks in, then he will give the talk in my place. So um, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's great uh, to be here, even remotely. And I would like to talk today about um, our recent work that is collaboration with uh, uh, with people from EPFL, actually uh, they are also on this call, uh, so they are the experts uh, on proteins. And uh, if I say something silly, then hopefully they can correct me. And uh, I should say also that in this work, uh, uh, the majority of the credit goes to them because they did most of the work. So let me start from a little bit far away. Uh, basically, we'll be using uh, a particular kind of uh, deep learning that we call genetic deep learning. So I hope that. Uh, I don't need to convince you that deep learning in the past decade has been uh, really a, a dramatic change in some fields, in particular in computer vision. It allowed uh, to democratize some of the tasks such as image recognition and achieve uh, groundbreaking performance. So here you can see the famous already image, uh, the historical performance on ImageNet Benchmark, where from 2012 uh, all the winning approaches were based on deep learning in particular on convolutional neural networks, which is a special uh, deep learning architecture that allows uh, to 
share weights across uh, an image and this way reduces dramatically the number of parameters that are needed to, to, to describe this, uh, this neural network. And this is already a commercial technology. It's successfully being used in application, uh, applications ranging from uh, uh, self-driving cars to speech recognition to Google Translate. And uh, basically, maybe without even knowing it, uh, you're using uh, technology that is powered by deep learning. If we look at these successes, however, uh, most of them are limited. And most of the research in the field is limited to uh, data which has uh, underlying grid structure such as images, which are two-dimensional grids, or acoustic signals, which are one-dimensional. But in many applications, especially in biology and, and medicine, uh, we encounter data where uh, we don't have this uh, underlying grid assumption. We call this non-Euclidean structured data. Uh, social networks are perhaps the most prominent example. Uh, social graphs such as Twitter or Facebook have uh, hundreds of millions or even billions of uh, nodes and uh, uh, edges that represent relations between users. And uh, we cannot directly apply uh, deep learning methods to this data. We need to generalize some of the operations that, that, that we can define on grids. And there are many uh, uh, appealing applications in, in biological sciences, for example, different interactomes or interaction networks uh, can be addressed by these, uh, by these methods. So we call these uh, methods geometric machine learning or geometric deep learning, as opposed to traditional methods that do not use these uh, or cannot uh, successfully exploit this underlying structure. So the, the, the term geometric deep learning comes from uh, a paper that, that uh, I uh, wrote with uh, some, some other people where basically at that point of time, it was still uh, uh, in a nascent field that now it, it has become uh, much more popular and probably less of a niche. It's already being used successfully in uh, many fields. And uh, you can see it as a quite natural evolution from historical perspective of, uh, of deep neural networks. You can actually uh, uh, prove that, that even very simple neural networks with one hidden layer uh, are universal approximations. Basically, you can uh, use them to approximate any function to any desired accuracy you want. And basically, this uh, deliberate uh, abandonment of uh, this general generality towards uh, uh, something that is uh, problem tailored, like convolutional neural networks, where you explicitly incorporate shift invariants into the model, was actually one of the reasons for success of deep learning that, that, that we know it today. And we can continue this analogy, extending, for example, shift invariants towards other uh, more general group uh, actions and to non-Euclidean spaces, which is exactly what we are trying to do. Uh, the prototypical objects that are considered in this field are graphs and manifolds or surfaces. And uh, because graphs are very uh, abstract and very universal uh, mathematical abstractions of uh, systems of relations and interactions, you can nowadays find uh, works that try to apply uh, geometric deep learning to a very broad range of uh, problems from recommended systems. For example, this is what we are trying to do at Twitter and other companies as well. Particle physics, such as neutrino detection or a large hadron collider. Uh, drug repositioning, computational chemistry, fake news. So uh, uh, Alex mentioned uh, 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 me working at Twitter. It was a result of an acquisition. Basically, we had a startup company that uh, used uh, geometric deep learning on graphs to try to detect fake news or misinformation. And it was acquired uh, by Twitter last year. That is probably, at least to my knowledge, the first uh, commercially successful application of this technology. Now, talking about graphs uh, and uh, computational chemistry, if you look at the space of uh, mid-sized molecules, I think it's hard to estimate, but it's a humongously large number. I think estimates for Ironman, let's say 10 to the power 60, would not be uh, too much off. And if we look at the number of candidates that we can experimentally test, it will probably be in the range of thousands. So think of uh, candidate drugs that you want uh, to, to develop against some pathogen. So we have this huge uh, gap between what can actually be synthesized and what can actually be tested. That can be called a computational funnel. And to, to, to bridge this gap, uh, you can use uh, computing techniques. You can do quantum mechanical simulations. You can, do, uh, you can use DFT. So uh, several years ago, uh, a group at DeepMind showed that you can use uh, graph neural networks uh, to achieve uh, simulations that are similar to, to the accuracy of DFT, but being between three to five orders of magnitude faster. So it allows at least potentially to do very fast virtual screening of, of molecules by predicting their properties. A more interesting direction is actually the opposite direction. You can have generative models which 
represent molecules in the vector space, what is called the latent space, so it's a kind of an outer color architecture, and you can synthesize new molecules with desired properties. And it has been uh, actually a work from MIT that was published on the cover of Cell uh, uh, a few months ago. And uh, that was uh, uh, using these kind of techniques uh, to, uh, to, to discover new antibiotics. And probably the, the holy grail of all these fields is not only to predict molecules, but an entire chemical reaction that leads to them, what is called retrosynthesis. Now, another application in biological science is also talking about drug design or drug repositioning is using graph neural networks uh, to try to uh, predict, for example, side effects uh, of drugs when they're taken uh, in combination, what is called polypharmacy. So that was a very cool work from Stanford uh, two years ago that uh, again modeled uh, the interactions of drugs with human proteins uh, using graph neural networks. And I myself was involved in a project that uh, took a similar approach, basically we looked at molecules contained in food and try to predict whether uh, they are similar to oncological drug molecules. And uh, surprisingly, there are no burgers or, or chocolate, but you can find uh, some boring stuff like cabbage or celery or, or tea uh, that contain many such molecules. So uh, today I would like to talk primarily about the deep learning on surfaces, because as I will explain in a few minutes, that's how we'll be modeling our proteins. So uh, this is the second uh, prototypical uh, object that we're dealing with in uh, genetic deep learning. And uh, let me start with uh, a little bit far away still. Uh, most of the applications that at least initially we considered in this field came from the domain of computer vision and computer graphics. And what you see here is uh, what is called markerless motion capture. So this is a kind of special effects that are used in movie production. If you've seen movies like Avatar, uh, basically these are synthetic uh, computer graphics uh, generated images that are uh, driven by a human actor, as you can see here. So essentially uh, there is a 3D sensor that captures uh, in real time the face of the actor and then finds a correspondence of this uh, face to some canonical model of the face. And then the, the task is to uh, recreate the facial expression of the actor by basically uh, uh, producing a new embedding or a new uh, 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 new positions of the points of this canonical phase. So we can distinguish here between two problems of analysis and synthesis. One is finding correspondence, another one is generating the, the, new, uh, the new surface. And here, uh, obviously, an interesting question is uh, how to represent uh, geometric 3D shapes. And uh, unlike images where, uh, let's say, 99% of cases you would use representation as, uh, as a matrix of pixels, uh, when it comes to 3D data, you can actually use uh, different representations. You can think of uh, an array of voxels. You can think of point clouds, for example, or you can think of surfaces that are discretized as uh, triangular uh, meshes. Uh, so uh, what I would like to argue is that uh, in uh, this kind of application that we will consider uh, in, uh, uh, in this field, uh, volumetric representations are very wasteful. Because if you think of a surface, actually all the inside is empty. So you, you spend a lot of uh, voxels for nothing. When it comes to point clouds, you, you, you lose uh, the geometric structure, the geometric information. It's basically just a set of points. So uh, for many applications, like the one that I mentioned with uh, motion capture, uh, using surface or meshes uh, is much more natural representation. And one of particular motivations, we wanted to use this uh, representation also that we deal with deformable surfaces. And uh, I think this image shows uh, in the best way what we are trying to achieve. Basically, instead of applying the filter uh, in the Euclidean space, we try to, uh, to define it intrinsically on the surface itself. So if the surface deforms, the result of the filter will remain the same. And this uh, allows to incorporate these deformation invariants into the model and saves a lot of uh, computation, a lot of complexity. Also, uh, uh, it eliminates the need for massive amounts of data because we don't need to learn deformations from examples. We already have them built in, into the model. Now, the big question, of course, when we uh, move away from standard, uh, well-known uh, uh, deep learning architectures, such as convolutional neural networks, the question is, what is the alternative of uh, basic operations such as convolutions? So in images, you can think of uh, convolution as a sliding window that runs over the, your, your image. Uh, but the question is, what's the analogy uh, on a surface, which doesn't have a grid-like structure. 
And one of the main differences is that if an image I can think of convolution as uh, basically extracting a page from different location and multiplying it by some uh, learnable set of weights, uh, the very operation of extracting the page is exactly the same, even though the content of the page will be different in the image. On a surface, uh, the result can be different because of the non euclidean structure, because of the curvature of the surface. And we've shown that was, uh, uh, to my knowledge, the first paper that proposed intrinsic mesh convolutional neural networks that you can actually reinvent and replace uh, the standard convolution, uh, convolutional filters with equivalent operations that they call geodesic convolution. And we can also do it efficiently with a linear uh, complexity. So here's an example of the architecture. That's the architecture that we use uh, in our work. Uh, we call it uh, uh, MONET, or a uh, mixture of uh, uh, Gaussian architecture. Basically, it assumes that we have a mesh that represents the, the, the surface with uh, vertices that are equipped with uh, some feature vectors. And uh, we construct around each vertex a local system of coordinates. In particular, we can use geodesic polar coordinates, where you have radial and angular coordinate. And we assign uh, in this uh, system of coordinates some system of weights. So you can think of them as a kind of soft pixels. So these are actually learnable as well. We can make them learnable. Uh, usually they are, they are parameterized as Gaussian kernels. And then basically this allows us to extract a fixed number or fixed dimensional representation uh, of the features uh, that uh, represent the, the, the features uh, in the local neighborhood of uh, a pixel. So that's a non Euclidean analogy of a pitch. And then you do the same thing, you multiply it by the filter, and you get the analogy of convolution. One thing to, uh, that is important to note here that unlike a grid where you have a global orientation of your, of your uh, coordinate system, here we have the rotation ambiguity. So it is possible either to fix it canonically, or you can just uh, do what we call angular max pooling. Basically, we look at rotating patches and we try to determine the orientation by the maximum response of the, the filter. So we use these, uh, uh, these architectures to, uh, to do uh, uh, shape correspondence. Here you can see some examples. With, uh, these methods currently produce state-of-the-art results. So here the correspondence is represented by texture mapping between the surface on the left and uh, the other surfaces. And you can see that the correspondence is nearly perfect. We can also use it to generate new surfaces. So you probably know uh, the standard way of representing uh, uh, embeddings of words, let's say, uh, in uh, models such as word to vec where you can uh, uh, do these uh, algebraic manipulations of your data. So here we have uh, uh, a facial surface. We subtract from it from, from it the neutral expression and uh, a, a different identity, and we get the new identity in the expression of the, of the first person. We can also use mixed models where the input comes from an image and we try to reconstruct a three-dimensional uh, mesh. So this is uh, useful when you try, for example, to do hand pose prediction. And uh, we have a recent paper that will appear in CPR this year where we can do it in, in the wild for uh, predicting the pose of the hand. And these kind of methods are also used in commercial applications. So you can see an example of 3D avatar that is computed uh, in real time on uh, a smartphone from 2D video input. So that was uh, the background about genetic deep learning. Uh, let me now move to uh, how we use it uh, for protein design. And uh, this is uh, the paper that appeared earlier this year on the cover of Nature Methods. So I guess you know better about proteins than myself, but nevertheless, for the sake of completeness, proteins are uh, long chains of uh, amino acids that are uh, under uh, the influence of physical forces fold into uh, structures such as spirals and, and planes or helixes and sheets. And uh, these in turn uh, create secondary and, and tertiary structures. So uh, a good analogy is this uh, snake toy, which is one dimensional structure, but you can fold it into very complex uh, three dimensional shapes. And a classical problem in bioinformatics is protein folding, basically given uh, a sequence of amino acids, uh, to predict its uh, three-dimensional structure that it will assume as a result of folding. We are actually, in a sense, trying to do the, the converse. You can think of protein design as a kind of inverse folding. Basically, we, uh, we have some target structure and we want to produce a sequence that, uh, that, that uh, assumes this, uh, this structure. And usually, we are not looking at the entire folding, but we look only at uh, some sites on this uh, surface that, that we want to modify. 
And a good analogy is a lock and key, which obviously is a simplification. Basically, you have uh, some structure in which you want to fit, so uh, uh, two proteins will uh, uh, stick to each other when they have kind of complementary structure. It is more complicated because it's not only geometric complementarity, we also have electrostatic uh, uh, properties. Uh, basically, some portions of these uh, proteins can uh, attract each other or repel due to electrostatic forces. So, uh, somehow, obviously, what we want uh, at the end is uh, predicting some function. For example, if uh, two proteins bind to each other, but this is uh, elusive and it's not uh, not uh, not always known what actually gives the protein its function. So uh, 3D structure or uh, 1D sequence are used as a kind of a, a proxy for this. And uh, in particular, sequences are very appealing because these are one-dimensional uh, uh, sequences of, of letters. And uh, bioinformatics has developed very uh, advanced methods for sequence alignment. So often. Uh, uh, protein analysis is done by looking at, at uh, uh, the structure of the sequence. In particular, the hypothesis is that uh, you, uh, over the course of evolution, certain parts uh, or fragments of sequences are preserved because they uh, need to preserve certain function. And uh, this is not always uh, the case because we can find examples of similar sequences with uh, dissimilar structure that fall in a completely different manner. You can also find the, the converse. You can have similar structure that is produced by completely different protein sequences. And curiously, you can find uh, neither of these two. So you can find examples of dissimilar sequences with dissimilar structure, but similar function. So you can see this example of four completely different proteins that bind to the same target. And this is especially the case. Uh, yeah, Alex? Oh, um, Michael, Aviv has a question. Um, question from Aviv Regev. Does Michael consider, do you consider dynamics? So proteins are moving um, as in molecular dynamics. Um, and she said, she also says, sorry, if she, uh, if you already mentioned it, uh, she, she briefly lost her connection. Right. So uh, no, we didn't consider dynamics. It's, it's a good question, actually. Uh, one of the reasons why we work with services, I will, uh, I will devote a little bit uh, more time to it uh, in the next couple of slides. Uh, uh, basically, uh, it allows to, um, uh, uh, to deal with certain uh, uh, certain uh, level of uh, non-rigidity that can also uh, uh, be due to, to uh, uh, proteins wobbling a little bit, but basically the explicit uh, dynamics of the proteins, uh, short answer, no, we didn't consider it. It is in principle possible. Uh, it is complicated. We need uh, also to get this data. Uh, in most cases, it will come from simulation, but uh, uh, yeah, so the short answer, no. Right, so basically here, uh, again, uh, uh, we have uh, we might have proteins with similar sequence but the similar structure with the similar sequence and similar structure and the similar structure and the similar sequence but uh, similar function and uh, this is especially the case for uh, de novo designed proteins that do not have any underlying evolutionary history basically it's a protein that was engineered in the lab so it, uh, you don't have any conserved uh, regions it, it has never uh, been created in nature uh, uh, so you don't know how it relates to, to other proteins and uh, uh, this is uh, our conjecture, actually, that protein surfaces uh, contain information that we call interaction fingerprints that we can uh, extract and learn using geometric deep learning. And these interaction fingerprints will allow us to predict whether two proteins will, for example, bind. That's exactly the main point of the work. And here again, uh, thinking of proteins, uh, there are many ways of representing them. We can think of them as point clouds, what is called the uh, atomic diagram. Or you can think of them as graphs, the, the stick diagram, or secondary structures, as ribbons, and, and, uh, and so on. Uh, here we model proteins as molecular surfaces. And uh, there are several reasons why this is a good model. One of them is uh, the surface contains interaction patterns, basically with geometric and chemical features. The second structure is that the surface abstracts away uh, the internal structure that might be important uh, for other reasons, but not important for the interaction. And here you can see actually this cool video. It's a, a printed protein model that has all these ribbons inside, but the outside, the transparent thing, is the molecular surface. And you see that for interaction with this small molecule, all the internals do not matter at all. So uh, uh, basically, you care only about how the, the, the outside structure is, uh, what its shape is, and uh, how it is structured. Another reason why we want to work with surfaces, if you look at, let's say, a pocket that binds to, to, to this 
small molecule, you can see that if we take uh, a Euclidean ball, basically a sphere of radius in this case of 12 angstrom, it doesn't correctly capture the structure of the, of the pocket. But if we look at the geodesic ball, basically the shortest distance on the surface, we see that it exactly covers uh, the, the pocket and nothing more. And another thing, and this is actually this is to uh, Aviv's question, uh, proteins uh, do have dynamic behavior. They wobble a little bit, and here you can see an example. In many cases, this wobbling doesn't dramatically change their structure. So they move a little bit, so it's a kind of non-rigid deformation. And at least to some extent, our uh, geodesic convolutional uh, network architectures are capable of dealing with these deformations without uh, the results being affected too much. But this is something that we never really explicitly tested. So it's, it's a good question for the future. Now, how exactly we uh, deal with protein uh, molecules? So we represent them as surfaces. At each point of the surface, we, uh, we compute these patches. We used uh, patches of size of 10 angstrom. And in, at each vertex of the surface, we compute uh, geometric and chemical features, in particular curvatures and uh, 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 chemical properties such as hydropathy, poisson uh, uh, boltzmann uh, electrostatics, and, and so on. So at the end, we have five dimensional feature vectors at each point. And uh, each page is mapped into a local system of coordinates. And then we apply our uh, geodesic convolutional filters and maybe do some task specific things that allow us to, to address a specific uh, problem. And the particular problems that we considered is uh, interface site prediction. We want to tell whether a region of the protein is likely to bind to other proteins. Once we know that it binds to some molecule, we want to classify this molecule. And in this case, we considered uh, a particular set of uh, uh, small molecules of ligands. And uh, last but not least, the uh, uh, application we considered is fast protein to protein interaction prediction. So let me start with a motivating example, why we would like to do it, and in general, why we would like to design new proteins. So this is a, a, a famous uh, a protein complex, PD-1, pd one that actually is so important that uh, the Nobel Prize in, uh, in medicine 2018 went to the discoverers of the role of these proteins in uh, cancer immune therapy. Basically, a very short uh, way of describing how it works is that uh, it blocks uh, 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 the immune system from destroying its own cells. And some cancers express these proteins, so they become uh, 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 immune to the normal action of the, of the immune system. So by blocking one of these proteins, you can uh, allow the, the, the T cells to destroy uh, cancer tumors. And in this case, we would like to design a binder that would bind to one of these uh, proteins. And the way it would work, if we have the target protein, it can be cancer target, it can be any other protein, uh, uh, depending on the application, we first would like to use massive site to predict uh, the, 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 the interface where the protein uh, might uh, bind. And then we go for a database of uh, uh, sample proteins, small fragments. Uh, we try to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to find, uh, to match them to this, uh, to this binding site. And uh, this uh, user is used as a seed to construct the, 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 the protein eventual drug for example, that will be used uh, uh, in this application. So if you look at the interface site prediction, essentially it's a point-wise binary classification problem. We want to label each point on the surface, whether it binds or doesn't. And the training set are examples of interface and non-interface points. So basically we, we have co-crystallized uh, uh, complexes of proteins. We know that uh, 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 points uh, uh, that are nearby on two, uh, protein surfaces are uh, supposed, to, uh, supposed to bind. And here the, the performance criterion is uh, area under the ROC curve. And uh, we use uh, about uh, 3,000 uh, proteins split uh, between 90% in the training set, 10% in the test set. And here's how the architecture looks like. So that's, uh, uh, in this case, only one layer of geodesic convolution and uh, a few fully connected layers. Uh, that, that uh, computes this uh, classification. And this is a visualization of the typical results. So uh, we have area under the curve of about 84%. So that's uh, roughly uh, the, the, the average uh, area under the curve. So you can see uh, in green, the, the ground truth uh, interface. In this case, uh, we, we, you don't see the, the, the protein which binds to this, uh, to this molecule, but uh, that's, uh, that was uh, computed from the uh, uh, 
basically from the geometric proximity of the two molecules. And in red are points that are likely to be an interface. And you can see that it predicts very nicely where the, uh, where the interface is located. And here you can see the distribution of the, of the score uh, between uh, true interface points and, and non-interface points. And uh, you can see that they're pretty clearly distinguishable. Here you can see also an ablation study. We, uh, we tested the importance of different uh, features. Uh, in particular, distinguishing between geometric and chemical features, and you can see that uh, uh, the combination of geometric and chemical features produces uh, the best results. So here are some examples. So uh, this is an interesting example. Actually, it is an engineered protein that is starting from some protein that occurs in nature, the wild type, that was engineered to bind to, to, uh, to some target. And uh, we look at whether we uh, get uh, the interface signal on the original protein and on the design. And you see that there is no signal whatsoever on the wild type, and we see strong signal on the design, which is exactly what we wanted. So that's a good indication that the method works properly. And here's another example. So this is an influenza inhibitor. Uh, this is the signal that we get for the wild type, and this is the much stronger signal that we get for the design. And even if you look visually at these uh, interfaces, it's really hard to say uh, whether there is an interface or not. And here's another example. So this is probably more complicated. Here it's a, a structure of multiple proteins and assemble into a kind of a cage structure. So here the results are noisier, but still uh, uh, looks pretty nice. And uh, interestingly, we see that if we use deeper neural networks, actually these are not by machine learning standards at least, not deep neural networks at all. Uh, if we use uh, three convolutional layers versus one convolutional layer, we get significant improvement in performance. You also see that visualization uh, of the uh, interface score is uh, significantly uh, smoother and significantly better structured. So comparing to uh, 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 the competitors, uh, standard methods such as SPIDER produce uh, significantly lower uh, 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 accuracy. And you can see that uh, the confusion between the interface and non-interface points with SPIDER is significantly, uh, significantly higher. And here are some uh, results. So these are difficult cases uh, where SPIDER fails completely, especially this uh, example where uh, the, the binding region is very flat. Uh, SPIDER is unable to identify anything at all. And here are some more examples. So the second case is uh, massive ligand. We want to classify pockets. So here we assume that we know where the pocket is, but we want to predict to which of these seven cofactors it binds. And some of these cofactors are actually very similar. Uh, basically, if you look at their chemical formula, they are uh, uh, they are very similar. So it's uh, it's a hard problem. And uh, uh, this is a seven plus point wise labeling problem. Uh, the training set is on proteins interacting with different small molecules. We have about 15, uh, 1,500 uh, structures in total. And here, what is important is uh, obviously to carefully split the training and the testing so we don't train and test on similar structures. And we use it based on the sequence homology. So here is the confusion matrix. We see that it's, uh, it looks very nice. So we have strong diagonal where that's how it should be. And again, uh, an ablation study shows that the combination of uh, geometric and chemical features produces the best results. So here's an example. These are two proteins uh, uh, from bacteria and from mammal that are structurally very similar. So the TM score uh, indicates that they have structural similarity, yet one of them binds to NADP molecule, another one uh, binds to NAD molecule. And we have a very clear indication uh, that this is the case. So we don't uh, confuse between them. And uh, basically, the, 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 the structure of the pocket is uh, quite subtle. So it's really hard to say uh, uh, what makes one pocket uh, different from another, but yet uh, we are able to learn it. So the last application that, uh, uh, that we considered is uh, massive search. Uh, this is uh, in particular for fast protein to protein uh, interaction uh, uh, prediction. And in this case, we are trying to construct uh, local descriptors that are indicative of uh, interaction or binding. And uh, this is not a classification problem. Basically, we are using, uh, we want to compute vectors uh, for at each point of the, of the protein, which will be used 
uh, for downstream applications, basically for subsequent stages of the pipeline. So here we use the Siamese architecture of neural network, essentially two copies of the same neural network with shared parameters, and we feed it with triplets of points, where we have uh, one pair that they denote here by x and x plus that are uh, interactive in points, basically they are positive, so we have uh, 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 pairs of proteins that are known to interact. So uh, uh, the positives will be a point on one protein and a nearby point on another protein. And uh, X and X minus will be some random pairs of proteins that are non-interactive. So these are called negatives. And here we use, uh, we use either triplet loss or D prime loss, which is uh, uh, a slightly more fancy version of, uh, basically of uh, loss function that is used to train such networks. Uh, we train a total of uh, 6,000 uh, uh, protein to protein interactions against, again, split between training and testing was 80 versus 20%. Uh, and this is the kind of architecture uh, what we are trying to achieve. So here we have uh, our target, and this is the page that binds the target, and this is some random page that doesn't. So the first pair will be positive, and the second pair will be negative. And uh, we want uh, for the binding pair to produce similar fingerprints and for the uh, non-binding pair to produce very different fingerprints. So the, the, the loss function that we use uh, promotes a uh, uh, small distance between uh, the descriptors for the positive pairs and a uh, big distance between descriptors uh, for the negative pairs. And here you can see an example. Basically, these are a distribution of distances for interacting pages and non-interacting pages. So we see a very clear separation between, uh, between the two cases. And again, here, uh, the performance uh, is the best one. We use a combination of genetic and, and chemical features. Um, we have a, an open question. <clears throat> so a question from James Bain, um, who heard you say that the training and test split of the data was determined by sequence homology. Did you also consider splitting the data by structure similarity, for example, by TM score? Uh, maybe uh, this is better to ask Pablo, who is uh, the... Uh, yes, also, I forgot to mention that um, the, uh, Michael has invited some of his collaborators to be on hand to answer questions. So sorry, I, I didn't introduce them, but they are here as well. Uh, as you might have seen, Bruno answered a question. Yeah, so, so I, Bruno's there and Freya is also there and I'm here. And um, so basically... So basically, um, the splits for massive search were done based on clustering, based on TM scores. Here we didn't do by sequence, and the clustering was done in the interface. And also, um, we also at some point also did um, um, we, we also did some some splits where we did a very strict, um, um, super strict split, and basically that did not affect the the results. Um, so, but basically, if if you look at the paper and our supplements, you have the different splits. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Pablo. Right. Uh, can I continue, Alex? Y yes. Y yes, sorry. Thank you so much. <laughs> right. Uh, okay. So, uh, uh, so basically, uh, I was showing the distribution of uh, uh, distances between uh, positives and negatives. And this is another interesting example. We compare actually to uh, another. Uh, uh, handcrafted descriptor that, that was proposed before, uh, what is called the GIF descriptor, which doesn't use any uh, any learning, and uh, it performs reasonably well. So well, obviously, it achieves much uh, more accuracy. But let's say 79% uh, area under the curve is not bad uh, when uh, the uh, patches that have high complementarity. So these are proteins that that uh, uh, really fit well as a key and the lock. When we consider patients where the complementarity is low, and basically we split our data set uh, into this uh, into uh, high complementarity, low complementarity, and very low complementarity, you see that the performance of this handcrafted descriptor degrades dramatically. It drops below 50%, which is more or less useless. Whereas in our case, uh, we see that uh, we are still about 80%. So, uh, and that's uh, because we use learning and we can account for uh, basically for even though the complementarity is low uh, we still can can capture some meaningful features that, that, that are indicative of, uh, of interaction so the fast uh, 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 the, the fast uh, multiple uh, protein uh, uh, interactions if you think of this again of this uh, mental picture of a lock and the key here we have many locks and many keys so we 
we have hundreds of thousands of uh, different proteins. And uh, this is the large scale uh, docking. So uh, here we look at the number of uh, solved complexes uh, that are uh, top ranked, top ranked uh, and uh, you see that uh, Massive achieves, uh, well, almost the best results. Uh, the ZDoc plus ZRank uh, achieves slightly better results, but look at the time. So we are about four orders of magnitude faster than competing methods. So uh, this really allows to, uh, to do uh, uh, multiple protein-to-protein uh, -protein interaction prediction and in potentially uh, uh, consider networks of proteins that, that uh, in interact with each other. Uh, so this was for the, uh, uh, for the bound complexes. Uh, the results are not as great on unbound complexes, but we really didn't do anything special to, to, to deal with, uh, with, with this case. So uh, probably a simple data augmentation uh, might uh, actually work uh, reasonably well, but uh, this is something that is still work in progress. So again, back to this example of uh, have cancer. questions uh, from Orr Aschenberg. Yep. Um, so for your docking predictions, uh, did you ever break down performance by the binding affinities of the interactions when the affinities are known? When the affinities are known. So uh, the short answer is uh, no, but uh, uh, maybe Pablo can also elaborate on this. Uh, we did uh, we did some experiments where basically that were a, a bit more elaborate. Uh, uh, in addition to, to, to this table. Yeah, we didn't do it by affinity. Um, um, so no, the answer is no. <laughs> okay, thank you. Great. Uh, okay, so again, uh, the, uh, uh, the example of, uh, uh, of uh, cancer target, uh, basically uh, this is how we, uh, we do the, the binding prediction. We first identify the site and then we look at the uh, uh, at a database of around uh, 11,000 uh, 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 candidate proteins that, uh, and then we do uh, the alignment that predicts the binding. So here is an example that the first ranked is uh, PD-1 protein. So the, the target is pd one the, the, the top ranked is uh, a mouse PD, uh, PD-1, uh, which is uh, actually a very similar structure. The, 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 the ground truth, the, the, the true binder, which is human PD-1, is ranked number eight. And uh, here are some results, so this is still work in progress, and uh, uh, Pablo provided these, uh, these slides. So here we have uh, actually experimental results of binding for uh, the, the target uh, PDL1. So these are the different uh, fragments uh, uh, from which we, 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 we did the proteins. So you can see that uh, even though the binding site is the same, these uh, proteins, the design proteins, are completely different. So here you have, for example, this structure that two helixes across. This is one helix uh, along, and this is uh, this is a sheet, and uh, you can see that the binding uh, the, the binding is is, is pretty nice. Uh, probably the, the ultimate uh, uh, confirmation that uh, that these uh, computed structures work. So for one of the binders, we also have the crystal structure, and uh, you can see that the overall complex alignment is uh, has an error of less than one angstrom. And you can see in orange and pink the uh, the, the the model and the crystal structure align extremely well. So in the times of, of the plug, I think, uh, uh, how can I not talk about the novel coronavirus? So that, that obviously has attracted a lot of attention in, in this community. So we tried to, to, uh, to do our contribution as well. And uh, this is again, uh, results that Pablo produced just recently in these days. So take it with a lot of uh, salt. So this is work in progress. It has not been, uh, been verified in any way. But what you see here is uh, this uh, one of the spike proteins of the of the virus, and this is the AC2 receptor for which the virus is believed to enter into our body. And uh, you can see so the, the surface that is shown here is part of the of the spike protein. And first of all, we use uh, massive to predict the binding sites, and you can see that uh, the site that is uh, known to, to bind to the AC2 receptor is predicted uh, reasonably well. You can see it here. Maybe uh, from this view, you don't see it. Very well. We also predict another site that is shown here, uh, magnified. And for this site, we compute a, a, a small peptide that uh, is supposed to bind. So the way, uh, maybe it's not very clear from this picture, basically it's a kind of a hole in, uh, in a bigger surface where this thing fits. And uh, because it's a small protein it, uh, uh, or a peptide, it can, uh, it can fit there. 
and uh, uh, the hope is that this uh, this, this protein can be used to disable uh, disable the virus. But again, this is something that is uh, uh, still a very early work in progress. Uh, but it's good that at least results seem uh, reasonable and encouraging. So to conclude, I uh, hope that I was able to convince you that uh, genetic deep learning is an interesting new tool set for protein science. It allows to design task specific. Uh, descriptors that are constructed from the data for uh, protein structure and function uh, prediction. Uh, we've seen that at least in some applications, the results are significantly better and uh, way faster than using previous methods. And what is important that it's uh, independent of sequence or evolutionary history. And this is especially important when we deal with proteins that do not have, do not have any evolutionary history, like uh, de novo design proteins, where uh, uh, we can use only uh, only the geometric structure, but, uh, but cannot use sequence alignment. So what's next? There, there is a plenty of things that, that uh, are still uh, left open. Uh, the challenge of bound uh, versus unbound proteins is uh, one of the obvious things that, that we are trying to address. Uh, obviously, experimental validation, uh, like getting the crystal structure in vitro, maybe eventually in, in vivo validation. Uh, it is interesting, actually, uh, uh, that it was noted by, by uh, uh, in the blog post that that, uh, that reported our paper, that uh, in our uh, pocket prediction, uh, we didn't uh, incorporate any description of the uh, of the ligand molecule, and this is possible doing, for example, with uh, graph neural networks, which is uh, uh, which has pretty advanced architectures nowadays uh, to do it. Uh, Another open problem is end-to-end -end generative model, basically where we will be able to generate a protein, ideally a protein sequence that, that has a certain binding properties. And uh, once we have a fast uh, uh, prediction for protein-to-protein -protein interaction, we can actually try to address entire networks of proteins. And uh, this is obviously not limited to proteins. Basically here we are more or less agnostic to what kind of molecules we deal with. So other biomolecules such as DNA, for example, uh, would also be uh, potentially useful and attractive for this uh, for this uh, architecture. So at this point, I would like to mention uh, my uh, multiple collaborators that, that uh, in the past years we've been working on, on uh, genetic deep learning. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Michael. Of course, this is uh, a little odd because we can't all hear the applause, but I'm sure all 202 attendees um, uh, really enjoyed your wonderful talk. Um, so uh, I think there were a few questions uh, and we definitely have time for a few more. Uh, Bruno and Pablo, are you satisfied with the, the answers to the ones that were, oh, oh we, I guess we have some more coming up now. Okay, I'll just start reading them. Um, so from Fatma, we have uh, how is each pixel or point or amino acid represented? Right, so we don't really represent amino acids, uh, uh, even though, well, we, uh, uh, Freya has done some experience where we, we did a little bit uh, in this direction, but uh, the short answer, we, we don't represent amino acids. We represent uh, only the, the, the surface, the, the, the molecular surface, and there we have geometric and chemical features. So uh, the amino acid is uh, not encoded uh, in these features. Great, and from Rajiv, how extensible is this approach to protein small molecule interactions where chemical structure is known? So this is what we are currently trying, and then that's an excellent question. So uh, uh, let's say the closest what we did in, in the paper was uh, uh, the, the, the cofactors uh, uh, binding prediction, but we didn't describe the small molecule at all. So there are, essentially there are two possibilities. We can model uh, 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 small molecules as surfaces, so same way as proteins, there might be some technical challenges to do it, but uh, overall, conceptually at least, uh, it can be done. Uh, another uh, way would be to use uh, different uh, architectures to describe the small molecules, such as graph networks. Very cool. Um, from Weiku, how can we use Massif and protein de novo design? Okay, good question. So we don't really have a model that generates new proteins. It allows to, 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 uh, to discover fragments that can bind, and then to this fragment you need to attach uh, some, 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 some other stuff. Uh, so that's a little bit, I would say, a little bit disappointing. Obviously, we want to do something that uh, basically is a kind of a magic black box that, that you, 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 you press a button and it produces a protein with certain properties. 
uh, this is something that we are working on. Right? That will be, let's say, the, 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 the end goal of, uh, of this effort is uh, to produce uh, an entire uh, sequence that, uh, uh, that has certain binding properties. Very cool. Um, oh, really interesting question from Chris Sander. So regarding evolutionary history, could you learn from um, evolutionary history, um, presumably multiple sequence alignments, things like that, uh, which features are important? Right, so uh, we didn't do it uh, here because actually our conjecture was that we don't need evolutionary history that in some cases we anyway don't have. But uh, it is very interesting. I don't know if uh, anything in this direction has been done already, maybe using different methods. So it's uh, probably uh, uh, Bruno or Pablo can, can answer this better, but uh, this is something that would be very interesting to me. Uh, um, I'll, I'll just add to that, that maybe, um, you know, at least we conjecture that, that the information that we have is orthogonal to evolutionary history, and that if you were to incorporate it, you would just basically be able to reduce all the noise that we currently have with it. Do, Pablo or Bruno, do either of you wanna comment uh, further on any of the other questions that were, that were asked or that you answered in, in typing? Uh, no problem, if not, I just wanted to give you the opportunity. Oh, now I only now I see that there are many. No, questions. That's, yeah, that's fine. We wanted to, you to focus on your your talk. It's okay that you weren't watching that panel. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe Bruno wants to add something. Bruno, do you want to add anything? No, it's okay. Um, I okay. think it was a great talk. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Um, okay, uh, one more question from you, you Chu. Um, have you tried to use more features to describe the surfaces? Right, so uh, we didn't really try to use more features. So we did experiment. Uh, uh, so there are many uh, design uh, choices, like the size of the page, the resolution of the mesh, what kind of uh, features to use. So at early stages, uh, we did some experience with this. But at some point, uh, which I would say was uh, more or less, uh, uh, I wouldn't call it arbitrary, but uh, let's say uh, opportunistic uh, choice of features. So the, the, the particular choice of these features comes from the previous paper from 2009 PLS paper where uh, similar features were used. So we, we, uh, we just uh, used the same features, but we added learning on top of it. Uh, I think that in general, we shouldn't be pre-computing any features because that's the handcrafted part of the descriptor. So these features are definitely not arbitrary, but uh, one would argue that if you already using uh, uh, machine learning, why not to learn the optimal features? So all the features in principle are computed, uh, can be computed from the geometric structure, from the positions of the points on the surface, and from the descriptions of the atoms. So you can compute all the electrostatic features, you can compute all the geometric features from the surface itself. So down the road, we would like to get rid of uh, any uh, handcrafted features. That makes sense. Um, a question, another question from James Bain. Uh, have you tested uh, the ability to predict interaction surfaces with intrinsically disordered proteins that adopt their structure upon binding? Good question. So uh, my feeling, well, and I'm not an expert, maybe, uh, maybe Pablo can, uh, can uh, shed more light on this. Uh, my feeling that it will not work. Uh, so this is probably one of the reasons why the, the, uh, uh, the unbound case is uh, more difficult because sometimes in the presence of another molecule, the, uh, uh, the 3D uh, uh, structure of the protein uh, can change dramatically. And maybe uh, pockets will appear because, uh, uh, because, of, uh, because of this interaction. So uh, uh, this is a way harder problem. Fortunately, many fall into the category that we considered. Uh, I would just add that you would probably need to add a lot of um, dynamics in order to make these kinds of predictions on unstructured proteins. We have a question from Mikola who's raised their hand. Uh, Scott, could you unmute Mikola? Mikola, please ask your question. Okay, well, while we're waiting for Mikola, we have another question from Maria Wendt. Um, have you looked into antibody antigen binding data sets and have you observed any differences in results or performance of your method between antibody antigen interactions versus general protein protein interactions? Probably a good question to Pablo. Pablo. So, uh, yeah, I'll add, um, in general, antibody antigen interactions are a lot more solvated. Um, 
And it seems that on elevated interfaces, the performance can be worse. Um, in terms of epitope predictions, as a purely anecdotal, I would say that we typically get half of them really well and half of them very poorly. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's due to this, this nature of some of them being extremely solvated and we don't pick up any signals. Thank you. Uh, Mikola, do you want to try again? You may be muted. Make sure you're unmuted. Uh, all right, so we have uh, another question. Is there a difference um, of your, this one's anonymous, is there a difference of your prediction when using different types of protein complexes such as monomer, um, homodimer, heterodimer, et cetera? Again, I think Pablo is much better. Pablo, yeah, <laughs> go ahead. I, 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 yeah, I, I think, I mean, I, I, I don't know if I understand fully a question, but I guess it relates also to unbounds and un, un, unbounds, maybe. Um, so, but I mean, I, I, so if it relates to that, um, um, basically our performance is, is more poor when you're doing unbounds. Um, and um, so, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question. Um, Bruno, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, so if I can jump in, I think for instance here is very, it's relatively easy to um, categorize in two different types of protein complexes. One of them being obligate oligomers and the other one being non-obligate oligomers. And basically the difference here is that if you have an obligate oligomer, generally, you know, this exists as an oligomer in cell every time that is expressed. And then there are other protein interactions which are more transient. So what it seems is that um, it was a, a little bit less good for non-obligate monomers, or sorry, for non-obligate oligomers. This is where we would see sometimes the the performance to decay. And in obligate uh, oligomers, we could actually see that the, 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 the interface signatures were, were there very clearly. I think that the answer goes in this, in this direction. We actually do have results with transient interactions, right? Okay. So in the supplementary material. Um, wonderful. I think I'll, I'll take one more question. Um, should, should we be wrapping up at uh, 10.30 or uh, should, um, all right. Do you have uh, Do you have any direction on that? I, I think that I mean the, the CC and E usually goes until eleven for discussion. So I don't know whether we should continue the discussion or wrap up. I'm very happy for the discussion to continue um, until eleven if people want to stay on. Okay, great. Thanks, Liz. I'll just keep. We'll just keep it going then. Wonderful. Um, okay. So here's another uh, another question from Fatma. Can the PPI prediction predict short peptide mediated PPIs? as in not domain mediated. Again, uh, guys uh, from UTFL, I think you take these questions uh, on biology. <laughs> okay, so maybe if I can say something about this, you know, this is actually a, a benchmark which we strictly have not done. Um, the, what we can anticipate is that in, in principle, if there's a large amount of interactions, Massive will be able to pick up the signatures, but strictly we have not done these good comparisons yet. Okay, um, a question from Alina. Uh, so he, uh, this one's a bit longer. Uh, for your for your COVID spike ACE2 PPI prediction, oh, this is on the, for the coronavirus spike protein, have you looked at how new non-synonymous mutations in SARS-2 spike impact binding to ACE2 as well as different variants of ACE2 that exist in human population? And have you performed a comparison between SARS-1 and 2 spikes to see if your model can predict the experimentally validated finding that SARS-2 spike bind more optimally to ACE2 than SARS-1 spike? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I guess we have looked a, a bit into this, into these differences in affinity between the spike, but I, my feeling right now is that single point mutants might be too little for Massive to be able to pick up the differences, okay? Because we're really sort of looking into signatures across the full surfaces. And of course, that sometimes, you know, point mutants will be able to disrupt um, the, the, the surface patterns but it seems this is the feeling that I have that just single point mutants are not enough to disrupt the signals. Um, so, but I see, I see your point and I print that your point is biologically relevant. It's basically just trying to understand if there are viral mutations which 
can make the virus escape and at the same time make it more infectious. Um, but yes, I think right now just with single point mutants will be fine. Great, thanks. Um, and I wanna encourage people, if, if, if you've asked a question and you have a follow-up or a question or comment, just keep, keep typing, we'll keep this going as interactively as, as, as we can. Uh, another, an, another anonymous question. Um, I think there was a quick slide on this, but how does this surface based on uh, neural nets compare to um, a 3D conv of mesh where you let the neural network figure out the surface or maybe a 2D conv of a distance matrix of the interface? Um, right. does so, so short answer that we don't have any direct comparison. So uh, basically these were uh, 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 works that, that appeared uh, uh, in, at the same time. So basically, um, uh, you can think of, uh, uh, of a protein molecule as a three-dimensional structure, volumetric structure, a point cloud, and uh, uh, use a standard 3D convolutional filters uh, on, on this data. So uh, I don't know how it compares. Uh, from, uh, from experience with other applications in computer graphics, one of the difficulty with, uh, with these 3D models is that they usually tend to require a lot more data because you, uh, basically your 3D conversions are typically not invariant to anything, even, even not to rotations. Uh, and uh, while in computer graphics and computer vision, this is a much easier problem where you can just do simple data augmentation and the amount of data that is available for training uh, uh, is, well, it's not unbounded, it's, uh, it's very large. With proteins, uh, probably the, 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 the one of the issues is that the data sets are relatively small. So we have uh, maybe thousands, of, uh, in the best case, tens of thousands of structures. And uh, definitely this is not the big data setting. So uh, uh, I would say that there is a, a big advantage to an architecture that, that uh, can train on less data, which is the case for geometric deep learning methods. So, uh, and again, this is uh, only an intuition. Uh, uh, we didn't uh, do any comparison. Oh, there was a follow-up, but I think uh, Bruno answered it. Won't the structure with the SNP be needed to answer this, answer these questions since features are based on surface representation, i.e. learn not predicted? Um, Bruno says if it's a simple point mutant, it could be quickly modeled and probably quite accurately. Um, Chu Ming Yao asks, can, can this method extend to predict protein and DNA uh, binding, nucleotide binding? Again, this is from the domain of, uh, uh, from uncharted territory uh, because we haven't done it, but uh, in principle, I don't see uh, a reason why it wouldn't. Basically, both are, are uh, molecules, right? So you can model them in the same way. So uh, uh, there might be some, some technical difficulties, but uh, I think on a conceptual level, uh, why not? I, I agree, yeah, exactly. I mean, there, obviously the charges are, work very differently when you bind DNA, but yeah, it should, should be very similar. That would be interesting to explore uh, through transcription factor binding and things like this. Um, any further questions? I don't see any more open questions right now, but we do have time. Um, Kali. Kelly Capel asks, for a PPI prediction, what is the smallest amount of data that you can use to, for training to get a model that's predictive? Well, also a good question. I think uh, it's always hard to define what is smallest, but uh, by machine learning standards, uh, uh, our data sets, which were just a few thousand of, uh, thousand of pairs, are very small. So uh, you should also uh, uh, have in mind that for PPI prediction, uh, basically the way that we train, we have pairs of pitches. So each, uh, uh, each uh, molecular surface uh, has uh, several thousands of, uh, of vertices, and uh, for each vertex we have a pitch. So it's uh, uh, basically, even though we have uh, just a few thousand of, uh, uh, of interacting pairs, the number of uh, positive and negative pairs of pitches is, is actually much bigger. So uh, again, this is a small data set. I should also add to this that we do a few tricks uh, to help the neural network. One particular thing that, that we found to be uh, very useful because the surfaces are complementary, we invert uh, the, the, the features in, in one of the patches. Uh, um, 
and uh, we've seen that this helps. Cool. So I don't see any more. I'm, I'm going to ask a, a sort of technical question about geometric deep learning. Um, how do you choose the um, the locations of the soft pixels in this um, sort of local geodesic coordinate system? So there, they can be fixed, just uh, some regularly spaced uh, positions. Uh, in our architecture, they're actually learnable. So we, we learn the parameters. So they uh, parameterize these Gaussian kernels, and we learn the covariance and the, and the covariance matrix and the mean actually. So you can, you can consider it as a Gaussian mixture, with, uh, where we learn the, the, the magnitude of the, of, the, uh, um, of, the, of the Gaussian kernels and, uh, and the kernels themselves. Cool. Sounds like the, there's a general emphasis on, on making everything uh, learnable rather than handcrafted when possible. Right, so we, we, we didn't uh, yet reach this stage because we still have a few handcrafted uh, things. I would say that this is pri uh, primarily uh, due to uh, legacy reasons and uh, we are working on getting rid of some of the, the choices that were made at some point just to, uh, uh, to go forward, but uh, uh, I think uh, it's, some, it's a good point of time to revisit some of the architecture choices and make them better. Related to your comment about end-to-end -end learning as well. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, we'll, give, we'll give the attendees another minute if they have, you know, going once, going twice. If you have any last questions on your mind, now's your chance. And um, if not, I want to uh, just extend a huge thank you to Michael and also to your collaborators, Pablo and Bruno, um, for joining us and, and sort of bearing with us through this, this slightly experimental format. Um, uh, and thank you so much uh, to CCNE. And I'm um, very happy uh, to say that we'll also be able to host this talk. Um, the recorded version of this talk on the MIA website uh, as part of our video playlist. Um, so thanks so much again, everyone. Um, I have uh, actually, I'm, I'm going to say we do have one more. One last question from Ian Coley. Um, here's uh, uh, a self-deprecating um, preamble, a bad question from a non-biologist. How hard is it to actually get a handle on the surface of the protein in terms of its geometry? A handle on the surface of the protein in terms of uh, so this is uh, and again probably Pablo can answer this better but this I is a bit atoms, so it's uh, basically once you have the the, the, the cloud of uh, atoms uh, the extraction of the surface there are several ways of doing it but this is completely standard uh, uh, standard thing okay. so any any chemical uh, uh, software can do it okay yeah I don't know if Pablo or Bruno want to add anything there. Um, no, I, yeah, I think that that's. And presumably, you guys have, have used. Uh, have you tried different tools uh, in terms of the input structure? Uh, in terms of generating surfaces, or in terms of. Yeah. Yeah, so so we've we've tried several tools. In the end, we settled for a tool that has like thirty years or twenty years. I think at least thirty. Um, but we we this is another thing we're trying to to of course looking forward to to get rid of right how to basically generate surfaces as part yeah. of a learn an end to end framework. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right. Any last questions? If there's no further questions, um, thank you once again. Thank you, Alex, for moderating so beautifully.